at there you six, go. Okay, now we're recording. 6.34 p.m. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the City of Sandy Planning Commission meeting. This is Monday, August the 23rd, 2021. Uh, we'll kick things off with a roll call. Commissioner Carlton is in um, Africa, so he is absent. Uh, Commissioner Lasowski? Here. Commissioner McLean Wenzel. So I'll mark her as absent for right now. Commissioner Lee. Here. Commissioner Hook. I'll mark him as absent for now. Commissioner Mayton. Present. Chairman Crosby. Here. And Council Liaison Sheldon. He, okay. he just popped in. Oh, okay, perfect. All right, we do a, did establish a quorum then. Uh, we had in our packets the uh, minutes from the last meeting, July 26, 2021. Did anybody um, that was there at the meeting see anything in the minutes that needs to be corrected, changed, updated? I see heads nodding, so we'll just take a motion. I'll make the motion that we accept the minutes as presented. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes for J July 26, 2021 as presented. All in favor, wave, put your thumb up. Okay, and I will abstain because I wasn't there. This is the time in each of our meetings when we give opportunities for the general public to speak to the Planning Commission on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you uh, will give you time to do that right now, I don't see anybody else in here, but um, we do welcome your comments at this time. If you're participating online uh, through Zoom, you click the raise hand button and then wait to be recognized. If you're here via telephone, you dial star nine, that will effectively raise your hand and then wait to be recognized. So any general comments uh, from anybody to the Planning Commission? We do have two people as attendees. I know one of them I think is just listening for the Parks Master Plan um, and I do not see any hands raised. Okay. With that, we'll move into your report, Kelly. Yeah, so my apologies. I, I went on vacation and then it just kind of caught up with me really quickly when this meeting was after the last one. So I never got a chance to write a report this month. Um, I could send you a link to the department report that was posted by David Snyder, who does our department reports and that covers a lot of planning and urban renewal items. So I could send that over to you all if you'd like after the meeting tonight. Um, and that will do a pretty good job of kind of bringing you up to speed on the larger land use applications and where those stand. What I did want to remind everybody of tonight is that we're, we have pretty packed schedules coming up. Um, the September 27th meeting has two hearings, one of which is an island annexation for the extension of Bell Street. So I, I don't anticipate that being very controversial. Um, but the other one is Deer Meadows, which is was known as Bull Run Terrace. And in that meeting we had, um, I think at least a dozen, maybe 20 people speak uh, before the commission uh, when it came before you last time. So I, I would anticipate that meeting in September um, taking some time. There's quite a bit of different things in the proposal that we kind of need to uh, wade through and explain. And then I believe there's going to be quite a bit of public testimony. That's what I anticipate at least. And then in, let me just pull up the uh, calendar here. And then in October, we, I believe are gonna have a special variance request and then also a 10 unit apartment complex, which is right by Mining Park that the city manager asked to bump to a planning commission decision, just because we think there's gonna be a lot of public input since it's right by Fantasy Forest. 
And so we will be bringing most likely those two items to the commission in October. And then in November, we will likely have a large um, 43 lot subdivision um, and potentially the need for a second meeting in November, depending on um, if one of the applications that we're reviewing for completeness right now is bumped to a type three or not. So we could either potentially do that a second meeting in November or maybe do a meeting in the first half of December. Um, I don't really wanna do one around the Christmas holiday or around New Year's. So I'd prefer to do one in the first two weeks of December. And that would fit a lot better into the 120 day timeline requirements for that application anyways. So I will let all of you guys know by email and then we can confirm at the September 27th meeting, but it, it's likely that we'll have to have a, an early December planning commission meeting would be my guess. Um, and then, and then you would all have off uh, the rest of December and most of the rest of the, um, around the new year's all the way until the end of January. So we do have a lot of proposals coming in and I know of a number of other ones that will be coming in as well that will need to go to planning commission, including I believe a four story building with commercial on the bottom and three levels of condos, um, which I believe is moving forward. And then also likely, um, there's a chance that a larger building with another food cart pod uh, will be coming before you as well. So we're going to have a pack schedule over the next, um, you know, six months or so. Um, and I see it continuing well through the winter time. So if I can get you, if I can get you a month off somewhere in there, I'll try, but I can't make any promises. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any questions of me tonight. Or any general general uh, comments or questions from any commissioner? Well, Kelly, just to confirm, the October meeting is that the twenty fifth? Because I don't see it on my calendar. Yes. Yes, that's okay. correct. All right. Thank you. Um, let me see. You confirm that you're coming to it. <laughs> I must I must have deleted it off my calendar. I'll put it back on there. <laughs> so you you're committed at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be in Boston if the governor doesn't shut down travel, uh, but I get, I come back on the 21st, so oh, 25th is no problem. <laughs> okay. Um I guess the only other thing I would like to add is that um you know, we considered going back to a hybrid meeting uh, with in-person attendance and by Zoom pretty heavily, Jerry and I discussed it um, and we got input from all seven commission members. There was only one commission member that felt strongly about going back to in-person, um, two people which were kind of open to either and four people that all said that they would prefer to stay via Zoom until such a time that the, um, the risks associated with COVID are less and also once the mask mandates are no longer required in city hall. Um, I'm not wearing one right now, but there's nobody in city hall but besides myself. Um, but typically if you come into city hall right now, people are wearing them even at their desks, so. Can I ask a, a question, Chair? Sure, That's yes. Kelly. So Kelly, I, you, know, you know, I work for the state. We have commission meetings. When we have hybrid meetings right now, our commissioners are all there with agency staff but the public are not allowed in, they're, they're virtual only. So if, if we do commission meetings in person in the city, can, they, can the public be excluded and only allowed virtually? Um, I think that would be a policy decision. Um, I know the city council is holding in per, a hybrid version and they're, they have decided that they wanna allow the public to attend as well. I think if the commission decided that they, you know, in the next few months, if they wanted to go back to a hybrid model um, or an in-person model, I think I would have to run that by our city manager. Um, but typically his feeling feelings on boards and commissions is that the chair mainly, but also the other commissioners kind of decide um, how they run their own meetings. So more than likely, you most likely could do something like that. Um, for now, at least, I do have to enforce masks, though, irregardless if the public's in the building or not, and that's because of OSHA fines or potential OSHA fines. Um, 
even independent of your vaccine status. Thank and that, you, and you know, Jared, oh, the only other thing I was going to add, and that, that was one of the things that Jerry and I talked about, and neither one of us wanted to get involved with trying to run a meeting and then also having potentially people come in that refuse to wear masks and kind of disrupting the meeting. And we felt that that could be a very difficult situation to try to manage. Mm -hmm. So Kelly, I was wondering how things are coming on the comp plan. I know there were some committees. <clears throat> um, yes, that's a great question. Um, and that's something that I wouldn't have been able to get in the update anyways, because we just made the decision on it this morning, actually. Um, so we, we put out an RFQ, a request for qualifications. We got back three responses from 3J Consulting, Angelo Planning Group, and MIG. Um, I believe two of those are located in Portland. The other one's in Hillsboro, I believe. So all Portland area firms. Um, we had five people score their proposals, including uh, Commissioner um, McLean Wenzel. She was one of the scorers. And then uh, we tated, we Shelly did some math and took like a weighted average. So we kicked out the high score and the low score. And the it was um, decided after that, and then some interviews as well that we conducted with all three firms that 3J Consulting was the top firm. So we just actually told all three firms this morning that we're gonna be negotiating with 3J Consulting um, moving forward and, and revising our scope, and then most likely or hopefully uh, bringing the contract to the city council in late September or early October to sign once we've negotiated the price with 3J. And then in addition to that, we've also uh, applied for a TGM grant through DLCD. And we're also going to be applying for a technical assistance grant through D DLCD. It's likely that we won't land both grants. I think they usually only reward one of the two, but they encourage us to apply for both because we might get rejected on one of them and um, get awarded on the other. So. That's kind of the general update of where we're at. Good questions. Anything else before we move on? Thanks. Well, we'll move right into our new business. We have um, three public hearings tonight. And um, at 647... I will open the public hearing. This is for file 21-027, the Olson Road annexation. And I will start by calling for any abstentions from anybody on the commission here tonight. Okay, nothing seen or heard. And uh, any conflicts of interest from anybody to declare? Okay, any ex parte contact? Nothing seen. Okay, for anybody that's uh, listening or watching from the public, if there's any challenges to any uh, members, individual members of the Planning Commission on this public hearing, again, uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, click the raise your hand button Wait to be recognized. If you're on the phone, dial star nine and wait to be recognized. Do okay, not I didn't see anything. Nope. Okay, if you testify, you must raise all issues you wish to address at this hearing. If your issue is not raised at this hearing, you may not be able to raise it later in any appeal. Your comments should state why the application should or should not be approved or include your proposed modifications you believe are necessary for approval according to the standards. If you do not raise specific issues at the final evidentiary hearing or by close of the record or fail to provide statements or evidence to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue, you will not be able to appeal the decision to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that particular issue. Any party has the 
may request that the hearing be continued to a later date or that the record remain open after the hearing is closed. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to the proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. We will move to staff report. Hey everyone, uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, so we're talking about the annexation of 37685 Olson Road. Um, this is a property that's currently in an unurbanized, um, sorry, an urban island, an unannexed, unincorporated urban island. Um, it's the property outlined in red there. It's about 2.89 acres. Um, this right here is Bluff Road, and then Olson Road grows right here, uh, disconnects, and then carries back um, over on the other side. So the applicant is requesting a type four annexation. Um, there are three types of a type four annexation. There's an annexation in conformance with conceptual zoning designation. So as you know, we zone, uh, we conceptually zone the UGB. Um, and when somebody wants to annex in and keep the zoning designation that's been applied to that area in the UGB, um, that's a type A annexation. They can also apply for a zone change or a comprehensive plan map change. Um, in this case, the applicant is requesting a type A annexation. So keeping that same zoning designation. So conditions for annexation, um, the site needs to be within the urban growth boundary, which it is. Um, the site needs to be contiguous with city limits, which it is. Um, the request must be in compliance with the Oregon revised statute, um, which is kind of a procedural thing and um, it is in compliance with those statutes. Um, and the site has not violated tree retention requirements. So if you've read the most recent update of the annexation chapter, um, there are certain tree retention requirements in that chapter that um, a certain number of trees aren't allowed to be um, uh, taken out of a site uh, prior to annexation. And the site, this property uh, owner has not violated any of those requirements. So there is specific annexation criteria for an island annexation. Um, typically when an annexation happens, we require transportation rule analysis um, that is not required for an island annexation. Um, and it also needs to meet a logical growth pattern, which um, traditionally it is good planning, um, good decision-making to annex in unincorporated islands. So our recommendation is for planning commission is to forward a recommendation of approval to city council. Okay, anybody have a question of staff right now? Pretty straightforward. All right, we will move to the applicant's presentation. And as um, for any testimony tonight, please start with giving us your name and your address for the record. I, I am the applicant, Jeff Saul. Are you yes. expecting a um, more detailed explanation that what then Shelley has already presented? Only if you would like to give it, uh, and maybe a, a commissioner, if you don't have a formal presentation uh, prepared, which is fine and, and maybe even wonderful. Um, <laughs> if any commissioners have a question of you directly, we I'll just entertain that or feel that right now. Yeah, that would be great. I would be glad to have, answer any questions. Okay. Chair, Chair, I do have one. I have a question that may not even be relevant at all, but it's just out of curiosity after looking at the plan. Um, is the intent to connect the, the two Olsons together? Um, at this point, the property to my west, it's a slightly over a one acre piece of property, um, is privately owned, and he has uh, really no intentions of developing his property. So, um, 
the the connection of Olson Street, which I think it fits into the city's transportation plan eventually, but um, the the likelihood of that happening in any time in the near future is very rare. So the access to that property would be coming out on the from the bluff side. Is that how I saw it correctly? Correct. Um, from Bluff Road to 377, uh, which is about one block. Um, to the north side of that road is a six lot subdivision that Tom Worth put in. And to the south of that is um, um, currently being subdivided by a gentleman, John Mahaffey. And as Olson extends from 377th to the west, um, it's currently just a gravel uh, easement down to the, the neighbor to the west. Um, and then if you, on the other side of the Gilbert property, which is my neighbor to the west, is actually the Sandy Bluff subdivision. Thank you, that, that helped me clarify it from, from my, I used to live on Olson, so I'm from, very familiar with the, the area there. I just was trying to understand the direction of traffic and, and how it was gonna flow when that was, when, if that's built. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we will move into public testimony and um, we will be asking for testimony in three segments. First, for those in favor of the proposal, then for anyone who is against the proposal, and then finally for anyone with a neutral testimony. Um, again, if you're on Zoom, click the raise your hand to be recognized. If you're on the phone, it is star nine to raise your hand and then be recognized. So we'll begin with any anybody in attendance who would like to give testimony in favor of the proposal. Please um, raise your hand and if recognized, give us your name and address. Uh, Chair, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to uh, proponent testimony or opponent testimony. If you are not in favor of the proposal, uh, please uh, raise your hand as uh, instructed. <clears throat> Again, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, and finally, any neutral testimony, if you're neither uh, for it or against it, just maybe have a comment or an observation to share. Uh, please um, be recognized as instructed. Once again, no hands raised. Okay. Um, with all that uh, detailed discussion, uh, <laughs> Shelly, do you have a, a formal recap you want to share? Uh, no, other than this is a pretty straightforward island annexation, and we recommend um, that you forward a recommendation of approval. Okay, and I'm supposed to give the applicant time to rebut any of the testimony. There was no testimony, but you, I'll, I'll give you a final opportunity if you want to say anything. No, applicant is fine with the discussion. Okay, I'll take a motion to close the public hearing. Chair, I make a motion to close the public hearing. A second. Motion has been made by Commissioner Mayton and seconded by Commissioner Lee to close the public hearing at 6.58 p.m. All in favor, give us a thumbs up. All right, that's unanimous. Move to discussion. And I believe that this one, staff provided a sample motion, didn't you? I guess uh, it was it was in the I other didn't ones. See it. I didn't see it. It was in <laughs> the other part. ones. I it was in the other two. Yeah, I I saw the other ones. I, I looked twice for this one. I didn't see it. So. Well, someone's going to have to make it up on the fly. Well, there's good, Jerry in the back. There is a recommendation with with the um, conditions of approval. With there's three of them. 
they're all um, pretty just boilerplate. They, yeah, I can go through them if you want, or no, you can just make uh, make the motion. Okay, um, I'll make the motion that we recommend um, file number twenty one dash zero two seven three seven six eight five Olson Row annexation for um, annexation to the or approve <laughs> the annexation to the city council as stated in the, excuse me, with the conditions of approval that are stated in the staff report. Sorry, a little long-winded. No, I think we got it. I'll, I'll second that motion, Chair. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded to forward the re annexation request to uh, city council with appro our approval uh, and with the findings or the uh, conditions of approval in the staff report. That was uh, moved by Ron, Mr. Lusowski, and uh, seconded by Commissioner Mayton. Roll call vote. Okay. Commissioner Lusowski? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes. Commissioner Mayton? Yes. And Chairman Crosby? Yes. Very well then. That was very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> okay now we've got two um two public hearings these are legislation legislative in nature so our public hearing changes a little bit um but we will open the next public hearing at 701 this is file 21-0 zero three five the parks and trails master plan any abstentions from the commission okay, nothing see to any any conflicts of interest this is easy we go straight to the staff report great um let me Share my screen. Oops. <clears throat> okay. Also, I have my door open and there's a playground right outside of my apartment. So if you can hear a bunch of kids screaming, um, they're not mine. Um, great. So we're talking about the Parks and Trails Master Plan Adoption. Um, our consultant team who has been working on this has done an amazing job, uh, put together a fantastic plan, and they've um, already uh, presented a couple of times the actual content of the plan. Um, so I'm just going to be going through uh, what Planning Commission's responsibility is as far as adoption. So the request for this is a type four comprehensive plan amendment because the Parks and Trails Master Plan does amend the comprehensive plan. So just to go through a very brief summary, um, and Tracy Johnson from the consultant team is here and she'll be able to answer any questions you have about the actual content of the plan. But the previous plan was published in 1997. So it's been a while. Um, there is a 15 year planning horizon for this new plan. So it uh, provides the framework for um, developing and maintaining parks and trails until the year 2035. Um, there's a pretty robust existing conditions assessment. Um, it recommends locations and types of new parks and trails uh, based on population forecasting and level of service analyses. It also recommends updates to existing parks and trails. And it has a number of impl implementation strategies and funding strategies, including um, adding uh, parks and trails priorities into the um, capital improvement plan. So the review criteria for a type four comprehensive plan amendment, which is what uh, planning commission and city council um, are concerned about with um, adopting uh, a new plan. Uh, the first criterion uh, is that the plan needs to be the best means of identifying a public need. Um, this is I think pretty self-explanatory. Um, a plan for uh, developing and maintaining parks and trails meets the public need for having those kinds of 
resources available. Um, it needs to meet statewide planning goals, which I'll go through um, the relevant planning goals. I go into them in a little more detail in the staff report, but I'll just go quickly through um, some of those planning goals that are relevant to this plan. So goal one is citizen involvement. Um, there were a number of surveys, stakeholders, interviews, and open houses that were conducted as part of the planning process. Um, additionally, as part of the adoption process specifically, there are these two public hearings with planning commission and city council. Goal two is uh, land use planning. Um, so the updated comprehensive plan that uh, we are uh, kicking off very soon will reflect the goals and priorities of this new Parks and Trails Master Plan. Um, and the Parks and Trails Master Plan is built on a factual basis, which I've actually learned since writing this that that mean, that's like a weird esoteric legal thing that only uh, applies to comprehensive plans specifically, but uh, it's still relevant to goal two. And then finally, goal five, uh, natural resources, scenic and historic areas and open space. Um, one of the requirements is to have an inventory of open space and trails, which this plan does. And um, another one of the requirements is recommendations for improving open space and trails, which this plan also does. And then finally, goal eight, recreational needs. Um, requires cities to plan for the recreational needs of current and future Sandy residents. So we know that Sandy has been growing a lot, especially since 1997 and will continue to grow. Um, and uh, it's really important as we experience more residential development um, that we're meeting the parks and open space needs of our current and future Sandy residents and this plan um, provides recommendations and implement implementation strategies to achieve that. So our staff recommendation uh, is to forward a recommendation of approval of the type four comprehensive plan amendment to city council. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, any immediate questions for um, Tracy Johnson from, from any commissioners before I just go for public testimony to see if anybody's hiding out there that wants to speak. Okay, then nothing heard there. We'll move into public testimony. And uh, in this area, um, we aren't giving separate opportunities for um, in favor of proposal. Uh, against or so forth you can just um, speak uh, to the um, to the application again if you're on zoom um, click the raise hand button to be recognized if you're on the phone it is star nine to be recognized so this is the opportunity for any public testimony to uh, speak uh, in any direction for against or neutral on the um, public hearing right now. Chair, sure, I do not see any hands raised. Okay. This is a typical August meeting. Not a lot of public participation. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're bothered by that on this and the <laughs> ones that we have tonight. Um, well, we would typically go to staff recap and recommendation. I don't think that Shelly has, unless you've gotten some enlightenment in the last three minutes that you, you care to share, um, we can go ahead and close the public hearing and go into our discussion. Chair, I uh, recommend we close the public hearing. I'll second that. All right. It's been moved and seconded to close the public hearing at 7.09. All in favor, give us a thumbs up. Unanimous, we're closed. So we can go to our discussion. I'm sure somebody has a question or an observation. 
I tried to think of a Don question just to ask it because he wasn't <laughs> going to be here, but I could not do it. So, <laughs> sorry, Don. <laughs> I, I will let you guys know one thing. Um, might be speaking out of turn here a little bit, but so the next agenda item, so the Parks and Trails Master Plan is the key component um, that helped guide the recommendations in the next hearing that you'll be hearing tonight. The other thing I just wanted to let you know is the city is also working on a revision to the SDC methodology, and that's how we collect parks fees for the improvements within the parks. And we're also working on revisions to the parks fee and lieu calculations, since that hasn't been revised in 15 years or so, or 18 years, I believe. And everybody knows the price of land is way higher than it was 18 years ago. So we're working with the SCS group out of Washington on those revisions and our attorney's office. So I just wanted to let you know, those will be seen by council probably sometime later this fall or in the winter. So those are other components and follow-up pieces to this master plan before you. I will say that the report itself is, um, for lack of a better word, is beautiful. It's very uh, well done. And uh, I appreciated looking at it thorough, thorough as well. Any other discussion? Let me see. <laughs> I've got to come back to my screen. I, I mean, I feel like I need to throw something in there because I did peruse and go over the document. It's very well organized, laid out. Um, I I hope, well, it's great to have when we go through, especially as bringing in new properties, et cetera, and how to connect them in. And it, it's just a great basis uh, for that part. And when I started this, I don't know, a decade ago, I probably failed to realize how important the parks component of planning is and having something like this to work off of is, is just vital. So thank you to everybody that worked on it and I hope we can achieve everything that's in there. Yeah, we all know um, just in our travels and so forth in other parts of the country or the state that we know a city that has done well in parks planning when we see it. And um, I think we all feel good about it. It's just, we just say, well, this, somebody has been forward thinking and has uh, done some things because it's, it's hard and difficult to make parks, and, and let alone expensive. Um, it's hard to get developers to give up dirt and um yeah i just like like what they're what they're doing i'm scrolling through it as i'm speaking here because there was something that caught my eye and i can't i think it was a section it was a technical thing and i we we're talked about uh overpasses or underpasses for um pedestrians over 211 and 26. And I saw something that said something about DeBarco and Bell Street. And I've been trying to figure out where DeBarco and Bell come together, but I cannot find that in the report. I didn't mark it. It wasn't, it was just more of a curiosity thing. If that rings a bell with anybody, maybe you can point me to it. It doesn't ring a bell with me, but I wish kind of in it that the uh, pedestrian walkways were almost designated as a parkland because as, as Kelly and his crew go out and lay out and work with developers on the subdivisions that interconnectivity with the walkways I think is just paramount to making that work to, you know just so you don't have to get in your car to go to the park um, anyway I think some of the recent subdivisions show how those work how well they, they can work Mm -hmm. 
Maybe it was the Sandy Heights over 211 walkway that you're thinking about. Well, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll find it later. And if it, it just struck me as I thought I saw DeBarco and Bell Street put together, kind of implying that they crossed or something. And I, I thought I kind of knew where DeBarco went. And Bell was on the other side of the highway. Yeah, the, those two roads certainly wouldn't cross. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it, and uh, so I can sleep tonight. But um, anyway, both, other both of those roads run west to east, so <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be very hard for them to cross at any point. <laughs> I'm I'm looking right now to see if I can find any reference to that. So if there's a typo, I apologize. I think it, more than likely it was just my misreading it. Not <laughs> But with that said, if there's no more discussion, this one does have a motion in the staff report. Well-worded and ready to go. I'm scrolling back up. <laughs> Get there. So there yes. are six crossings that are identified. They're in the appendix on table A4. And they are Bluff Road Crossing, which is a mid-block crossing. Um, Highway 26 and Vista Crossing, potential underpass. Highway 211 to Meinig Crossing overpass. Highway 211 to Barco, signal or underbridge. Signal, which would be mid-block or underbridge. Highway 26 in Orient overpass, that one's aspirational, <laughs> and Highway 211 in Gunnerson mid-block. Yeah, I don't think I was in the appendix, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, because it wasn't, it wasn't critical at all. Did uh, somebody find the motion? Yeah. I make the motion that we forward a recommendation of approval to the city council for the type four comprehensive plan amendment. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to um, forward a recommendation of approval to city council for this type four comprehensive plan amendment, which is uh, file number 21035. All in favor? Thumbs up. I suppose I could have been doing a roll call vote, but it's just as easy to do these visual ones. Okay. That takes care of that one. Does anybody need a break? Anything? If not, let's forge ahead. And this is, again, we'll open this one at 718. This is public hearing, file number 21-032. Um, the code amendment relative to what we just talked about. Any abstentions from the commission to declare? Okay, nothing seen or any conflicts of interest. All right, we'll go to staff report. Thank you, Chairman. So I worked on this one pretty closely with um, other staff members, um, ESA, so Tracy Johnson, who was just on the call, um, and some of their sub consultants, and also our city attorney's office. And so the two chapters that we're looking to revise are chapter 1732 which deals with parks and open space, uh, the zone classification of parks and open space, and 1786, which is the parkland and open space chapter that the commissioners are all familiar with. So this is the chapter that talks about dedication requirements or fee and lieu requirements. It also has some other requirements to deal with open space when that is actually designated and um, dedicated to the city of Sandy. And then it also just has some other general development standard requirements associated with when parkland is dedicated. 
So this section, these two code sections are being revised at the same time with the Parks and Trails Master Plan for a few reasons. One of them is to remove antiquated requirements that we feel are in mainly chapter 1786. We wanted to add 21st century uh, terminology and best practices. We wanted to solidify clear and objective code requirements, which has been a big thing in the last few years, especially with subdivisions and residential land approvals. And the other big reason which you've heard, I believe our attorney Chris Crean and attorney David Doofman both speak to, and Mr. Crean is here tonight, if you have more questions around this or the clear and objective code requirements, but it's to incorporate the Parks and Trails Master Plan by reference. So as you probably remember um, with the Bailey Meadows approval and situation, and then a few of the subdivision proposals that have come before you since then, in applications which are considered limited land use applications, which subdivisions are one of those, it is important to incorporate master plans into the development code. So right now, the 1997 Parks and Trails Master Plan is not incorporated into our development code. So that makes some hurdles for staff when we're trying to require uh, parkland dedication requirements. So one of, the, one of the main kind of thrusts of this whole code change is to incorporate the 2021 Parks and Trails Master Plan into the development code, and then also to incorporate the level of service requirements and different things within that master plan. Um, and saying all that, we sent notice to DLCD as required. We also published a legal notice in the Sandy Post. And then we also made grammatical edits and other things that we typically make when we do code edits. If you'll see in the staff report, I labeled the main three changes that I believe were the main three changes in chapter 1732. And then the main six changes that we made in 1786. Um, and then as I also pointed out, which we usually don't get into in planning commission staff reports, but I thought it was important to point out tonight is that there's probably a cost savings for parks SDCs with removal of the requirement to require streets around all sides of parks. As you're all aware in 17, let me get down to the section here. In 178620, there's a diagram that shows whenever parkland is dedicated to the city of Sandy that there should be streets around all four sides of that park. What has happened over the last, since I've worked here over the last 10 years, we've been challenged on that a few times. And what ultimately happened is there was a court decision about, I believe about five or six years ago, which made it uh, a requirement when, when uh, land is dedicated around a park in Sandy that the half street improvements closest to the park, so 14 feet of the asphalt plus the curb, um, the stormwater for that half street, the sidewalk, the street trees, all of that all has to be paid for by the city. And so typically what's happened is the city parks SDCs has picked up that chunk of money. And it's very expensive, especially for an SDC account that is really meant to be paying for park improvements like swings and slides, uh, water features, ball fields, different things like that when instead it's paying for street improvements. So one of, the, one of the things you'll see tonight is that that diagram has been removed for two reasons. One, because we think it is unnecessary to have park streets around all sides of a park uh, for the cost saving measures that I just explained. Two, I have had some conversations with Don Robertson with the, who is the chairman of the Parks and Trails Board and he said that he does not like the requirement either for other reasons. Um, some of the better parks that he and I were talking about around the state of Oregon do not have streets around the parks. Most of the best parks around the state have streets around maybe two sides of the park. And in a lot of cases, only one side of the park. So as you'll see um, in 1786-20, one of the main revisions is taking out that diagram and adding in some other standards about street right away. Um, on at least one side of a parkland, and then also that, you know, primary entrances of single family homes and duplexes shall face for towards the parkland when separated by street right away. So 1786-20A and B are basically revising what that diagram was intending to do. But in addition to that, it's removing the requirement to have so many streets around our parks. 
So I guess the big benefit of having streets around all sides of the parks would be that the police can patrol the park a little bit easier and you have more on-street parking for the park. But um, how the code's currently written is it's basically saying all parks would have streets around all sides. And if you go around Sandy today, I think there might only be one park which has ever been designed to accomplish this diagram. So even in Sandy, there's no parks that I'm aware of besides maybe one that actually have streets around all sides of a park. So even though we've had this diagram in our code for decades, I don't think any of the parks really in town with the exception of one has ever been built this way. Um, and our parks uh, and trails board chairman, Mr. Robertson, he has been the parks director of Ashland, Metro, um, I believe Gladstone, Gresham. And so he has a lot of experience, I think over 40 years of experience. And so when I heard from him that he also agrees with staff that it's a bad diagram and that we should change the requirements, um, I jumped all over that and thought this is the time to change that. So in saying that, I think 178620 is one of the main sections that I think we really want the Planning Commission's input on, especially on A, B, and C to get input from you if you think those are good requirements, to see if you think there's additional requirements that should be added, or to see if some of these requirements should be taken out of there. And then the other budgetary item, um, I know that was a long explanation there, but the other budgetary item is that ESA, who I believe is still on the line here, they can give you more information if you would like on the proposed um, per acre of parkland per, per person. So if you look in 1786, 10, and then on the second page, so page two of six, you'll see that the per person parkland dedication factor has been increased, which means that the city will then get more parkland in the future um, per person. So. I felt it was important to point out that budgetarily we're going to get more, either more parkland per person, or we'll be getting more parks fee in lieu with that calculation methodology with that increase. So, and then the other thing that I'm hoping these code changes do, which I didn't put in the budgetary impact section, but I hope it's a cost savings on attorney fee time, staff time, and the like for having to I guess I would say kind of battle or push and pull with developers and property owners as often as we do. So we're hoping these code changes, we don't, we don't think they're gonna fix everything as far as dedication requirements or fee and lieu requirements, but we hope that it will kind of bridge the gap and kind of decrease the challenges that are brought before the city from developers. So with that, um, there's a lot of markup in here. Um, so I know it's a lot to consider. A lot of this is just clarification, keep in mind, and a lot of it is either incorporating the parks, the 2021 Parks and Trails Master Plan by reference and or making the code more clear and objective. So a lot of what you see in red and blue, a lot of it isn't really substance or big changes to how we do things. It's more to make it more legally defensible and to make it more clear and objective. Um, I would say there's very little as far as like content change with the exception of 178620, that section does have some content change. So I think if you wanted to focus kind of your time on one section more than others, I would recommend that section. Uh, so that's, that's my staff summary. I know it's a little bit of a ramble, but it's with these code changes, it's always a little bit hard to explain what we're doing with them. But um, I think that's the major thrust of what we're trying to do tonight. Thank you very much, Kelly. Any immediate questions for Kelly? Sure, I just had one. Um, Kelly, in the 1786-20, there was a substantive change that I am I guess uh, I've heard before, but I wanted to just make sure I understood it. Um, and it's uh, under the new, it's the old E, but the new G. Uh, once the, the land is dedicated, this it used to be the city will assume the maintenance responsibility and uh, what I'm what I'm reading is it's inferring all of that to the home ownership of the surrounding area. Is that right? Am I reading that right? Common ownership by homeowners association that assumes responsibility for maintenance and a repair. Um, 
Yeah, so it's saying that parkland areas may be owned and maintained by any of the following mechanisms or combinations thereof. So it's, the first one's dedication to the city of Sandy or other public agency. The second one would be allowing for the common ownership by a homeowners association. And the third one um, would be dedication of development rights to a public agency approved by the city. Um, so there, wow. there's three different options or a combination of those options could be proposed, I guess. I, my guess is that most likely, especially with the removal of PDs, option number one is going to be picked every time, right. Right. although this does give the ability for them to propose one of the other methods. Um, okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I just, I, I guess I just mis misread that initially. Thanks. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Lusowski. I'm, I'm for, always forget to push my little raise hand button. Pardon me. Oh, the physical hand works fine. Oh, two things. Um, one is kind of the, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but going back to Bailey Meadows, remember when it came forward, Kelly, to us at least, the, for the parks portion of it, the city council had already determined that the Bailey Mills was going to pay a, lieu in, a fee in lieu of, for parks, right? So that it's always kind of bothered me in terms of how you can walk in with have that already decided. Is there anything in this that's going to change that around or um, it, it just still seems really strange that even before it gets really to planning or maybe it came out of the planning department that you guys were okay with it, that that was off the table. The, the parks portion of a hundred unit subdivision. Um, you know, I, I <laughs> maybe it's because I've tried to forget large portions of that development proposal just because it consumed my life for like a year and a half. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't but, mean to bring you <laughs> <laughs> But um, I do agree with you, it was a very odd way of doing it. Um, with, and I don't think we've ever done that before that. And I don't think we've done that since. So I think hopefully that was a one-off. I would hope that moving forward, we would continue how we've been doing with these more recent subdivision requests. And that's, they submit their information through an application. We get the parks and trails board input, and then we bring it before the commission to either make the decision or, um, well, to make the decision. And then in the case that it gets appealed, then ultimately it would be a city council decision. But yes, I, I agree with you. If um, I had that to do over again, I think we would have done a different, we would have done that differently than we did, uh, you know, but there's, three years ago. There's really nothing legally or whatever you can do to say that it's got to go through. Go ahead. I see Chris. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Commissioner Lasowski, uh, Chair Crosby. Uh, one of the other things that we've done here that I, I do want to point out is uh, on that subject to comply with the clear and objective requirement. We changed the, the parkland dedication requirement to shall, right? So a developer shall dedicate parkland in an amount equal to whatever that formula spits out, that formula in 17.86.10 a per person acreage per person. And that's it. If they want to get approved, they calculate how much parkland they have to dedicate, and that's part of their application. The fee and lieu section says the city may accept a fee in lieu of parkland dedication. So if the developer just wants to get approved under clear and objective standards, they calculate how much parkland they have to dedicate, they put it on the plat, and they go forward and build. If it turns out that's going to cost them lots or they can't figure out where to put it or whatever, for some reason they don't want to do that, they can propose a fee in lieu, but the city is not obligated to accept it. The fee in lieu section says the city may accept a fee in lieu at the city's discretion. So it, it really makes it uh, clear and objective up front. They have to, as a requirement, clear and objective requirement, dedicate the, the parkland. If for some reason that doesn't work out, they can propose a fee and lose, but the city doesn't have to accept it. So I would foresee, like Kelly was saying, 
an application coming before you that includes a condition of approval that requires them to dedicate X amount of parkland. And the developer can propose a, a fee in lieu of that. And it's up, it would be up to you guys then and ultimately the, the city council if you want to accept that fee in lieu. So that's the way we have it structured now. So, and again, I am bringing up bad memories of, of the Bailey Mills <laughs> because it came in here before us or Kelly's department first. And when it got to us, it had already been decided that it was going to be a fee in lieu of and there was no parkland dedicated. Yeah. And so it was, that, that's my understanding kind of behind the scenes. It was already taken off the, off the uh, shelf or whatever or as an option. Yeah, but, I wasn't part of that. And I don't, yeah, I don't know how that was evaluated under the, the code prior to these changes. Um, so I don't, it, it's not unusual by the time a proposal gets before you guys, we've been talking to the developer for several months and may have a recommendation, but that's all that it is. And so if the developer wants to propose a fee in lieu and we think it makes sense, we may recommend it. But if you guys disagree, it's really up to you. Um, but the way we have the code structured now, they have to dedicate it um, as a clear and objective requirement. And then the city can accept the fee in lieu if you want to. Yeah, and, and what I can add to that, uh, Commissioner Lasowski, is like I said, I hopefully that was a one-off. I do agree it was um, looking back now and reflecting on it. I think it was um, it was an out of sequence decision, I believe that we typically wouldn't have done. We would typically have got the planning commission's probably recommendation before the city council made any sort of decision on a land use proposal that at that point was only a type three. It wasn't appealed at that time. So I, I agree with you, it was odd. And looking back, um, I don't think we would go that route again, or at least I would not recommend it. Um, thank you for going over for rehashing history on that. And um, I like what you're saying in terms of trying to thwart it in the in the future. Um, I also want to go back to 178620 if I can for a moment. And that was the one you asked us to pinpoint on. You want uh, to hold this for our discussion time? Oh, I'm, or? Sorry. I'm sorry. I thought we were already in it. No. Yeah. Well, we may be there quite quickly because um, we have to give opportunity for any testimony of anybody. So if it's okay, I'll go ahead and take care of that uh, element of business. And so we'll move to public testimony section. Uh, opportunity for anybody uh, to speak either for the proposal against it or any neutral testimony. Uh, again, if you are on Zoom, you raise, click the raise hand button, to wait to be recognized. If you're on the telephone, it's star nine to uh, effectively raise your hand and, and wait to be, um, to be recognized. So with that uh, said, we'll give opportunity for anybody who's in the meeting to, uh, from the public to give testimony now. And if you do speak, please start by giving us your name and your address for the record. So this would be opportunity for public testimony, either in favor or against or neutral on uh, this public hearing issue. Well, Chair, it looks like you guys got uh, three hearings with no public testimony, so <laughs> that might be up for <laughs> <laughs> No complaints. All right. Um, any recap? And we'll, if not, we'll go ahead and we can close the public hearing and then Commissioner Lusowski can pick up. Yeah, I, I don't have any recap. We can move straight to discussion. Okay, let's uh, have a motion to close before we forget it. Chair, I make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. It's been moved and seconded to close the public hearing at 7.38 p.m. All in favor, thumbs up. Okay, unanimous, we're closed and discussed. And I'll turn the floor over to Commissioner Lusowski to continue your thought. Well, first of all, uh, please accept my apologies for speaking out of turn. I just jumped ahead a little bit, but but going back to 1786-20, um, I want to the number C, 
for the dedication of the, uh, uh, what do you call it here? The walkways, I think is great. And but going back to number A, he has a, I'm trying to figure where the, the primary entrance of a single family home would be facing the, this, the right of way. Am I missing something on that? Yeah, there could be a case where the house is a single or the lot is single tiered and the code would typically require. Yeah, and that's a good point. There might be some other clarification that needs to be added here. There could be a case where there's a single tiered lot. So there's a lot with parkland on one side after the street and on the other side is another road with a higher classification, in which case the code would say the front door has to face the transit street. But I guess what this would be trying to say is, irregardless of that, the front door has to face the parkland. Now, I'm not, I don't know if that's a great code requirement or not, because then we don't have the front door facing the transit street. Um, but that, that was the intent. And I can see after your question, it's probably not clear enough. And I'd love it. Yeah, talk to you more on it. Just again, we go back and we force sometimes somebody's kind of back of their house to be the front of the house when they can't park there. It's it's always bothered me. And I wish we'd have a different alternative for maybe uh, hedges, fences, you know, some type of natural buffering um, when people have their front door, but nobody can pull up and park to it if, if, it's, if it's that type of street. But hopefully if it's a park, it wouldn't be that way. So thank you, that's it. I had one, oops. I'm looking for it. I mean, can, it, can I actually ask something, Commissioner Lasowski, while uh, Chair Crosby yeah. thinks about that? So I guess what is your guys' feeling if we did have a case? These, this is why the code gets so tricky. Um, where we do have a single tier lot and on one side, and they have streets on both sides. That's actually how my house is. There's streets on both sides. Would you rather have that house face the parkland across from the local street, or would you rather have that house face the transit street, which would be a collector or arterial? Well, what's the first option again? To face <laughs> the, like, face the the face of the regular street that they yeah, so the code rate so in an example like that the code would say the house has to face the transit street and the local street would be the back essentially what this would do this proposed code and now i'm seeing it needs to be written more clearly what it would do is basically say the front of the house has to face the parkland and so it would basically override that transit street section but i don't know if that's good or bad i you know I was just thinking, trying to, and if a if a park is built first, and and we only have to have a street on one side, let's say, so the what we would say is the back of the park doesn't have a street at its at its initial development, and then somebody comes in later and puts a development on the back side of the park and puts a street on the backside, but that new development kind of has an orientation away from the park because of the new community being developed there. Um, I could see where it, you would kind of want that house to face into the new community that's being developed. Um, and its back would be to the park. I agree with Jerry. I mean, because if you're there in that, there's a great word community, you want your front doors to face your fellow people that you live with um, and, and interact with. And, you know, we've hit this a bunch of different times of trying to keep that backside looking nice um, and not just be, uh, we, we go through examples on DeBarco that we've always talked about. On one side, you know, you got a fence, the other side, some nice greenery. But I, 
I think the more important are as the party go along with it on those communities are the walkways and the pedestrian, the pedestrian access points to get to the park, which I think give you the best of both. You can be community with your friends with your front doors facing each other and then have access for everybody in that community to get to the park to and fro. Sorry, my dog's attacking me. Let's go out. <laughs> so, um, I guess at this point, that would uh, just for um, kind of procedural thing here, Kelly, you would take note of any changes that might be implied by this discussion and that's what we would be recommending with approval yeah and okay. even even if you do decide to go with my recommendation there it still would need more language to explain that you know in such a case mm -hmm. this section um rules how does it, yeah, how does it prioritize the, yeah, uh, the orientation of, of homes yeah, it would, it would have, I would work with Chris to come up with some language that this section would um, govern the standards and override chapter 1782 that deals with special setbacks on transit streets. And Kelly, I would, I would also like to add, if there was some changes towards that, that the, the backside of the so-called development of houses, I would it'd have to have something in there to provide some type of screening, um, again just not a roll of fences and i'm not sure we've come up against this before but how to put that in there so that when you're looking out from the park it looks it, it's giving you kind of the um it's giving the homeowner the best of both they have their front door facing their community and the the people in the park are looking out on something nice as opposed to just a cedar fence so yeah, it gets, it gets hard with those double frontage lots because mm -hmm. most people want a six foot fence on one side so they can have their dog in there or a backyard where their kids can feel more protected. And sometimes the code requirements that we have don't really allow any tall fence. You know, everything has to be four feet or under. So True. while from a planning perspective, that might not be a bad thing. As a staff member, it's a pain because nobody actually wants to follow those code requirements. Okay. So, yeah because <laughs> uh, you get a new homeowner and they think they can put a six foot fence up and then they get told no and um it's not it's never a great thing to have to tell a first time home buyer in sandy like oh welcome to sandy and by the way you got to shave two feet off your fence <laughs> welcome to friendly sandy so i don't you know i don't know that it's one of the ones i was toying around with right up until the day i published published this was those the first three um, in that section, A, B, and C. I was trying to maintain some of what we have in our code with that diagram by writing up A, B, C. But I, that's why I said I really want you guys to focus on that because I don't think even what I wrote, I don't really love. So, And I don't know if we should prioritize front doors to transit streets, parks, neither. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. How difficult would it be for someone to uh, make an exception to that if the circumstances really would have a preference for one or the other? Um, yeah, they would likely have to make a special variance request of the subdivision proposal. More than likely, that would be the solution to it. So it would kick it up to a planning commission decision, which might not be a bad thing. Yeah, Kelly, um, sort of looking at C and thinking of what Ron just said a moment ago about, you know, having the house, uh, a later development house with its back to the park, front towards the new community, but having a walkway to the park. This one, C, only, only as I read it, only makes that walkway a requirement for multifamily development or a manufactured home park. Yeah, and the, 
and I'll explain why that's the case, or at least my thinking, and maybe you guys can tell me my thinking's off here, but currently in the code, when you develop multifamily, there's no, um, it's more ambiguous if the block length standard applies because there's not streets every 400 feet or 600 feet. With a single family home, duplex or row house development, it's very clear and objective in our code that the block length cannot exceed 400 feet. And if it exceeds 600 feet, then you have to provide a pathway. Um, even, if, even if you get a variance to the block length standard. But the multifamily development, um, it's, it's not very clear that you have to follow those block length standards. At least, at least um, we've been kind of questioned about it and I've found in the past that it's not very clear. So that's something that we'll probably wanna revisit when we update our land division and residential uh, multifamily standards. But that's what, that's what that's attempting at least, is that in the case that it's a multifamily development and say it's a really large one right by a park, that they would at least have to provide a pedestrian walkway through the development. Um, and it, again, that's probably, now that I'm reading it again, probably needs more clarity because it doesn't say that it has to include a public pedestrian easement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't, my point was that it it's a single family um, is not included. So single family homes wouldn't be required to have a walkway to the park. Is that correct? Um, that is correct. You mean an individual single family home? No, the a new development that's done after the park has been set up and it's on the, you know, the backside. Now we have this new develop new community, but they're all that's single family residents. Isn't that where the block length changes? It becomes much shorter. So you don't need the same access. Yeah, that I mean, that's my reading of our subdivision code is when you do a subdivision, then the block length requirements and track requirements for pedestrian easements kick in. Okay. So if you have a big chunk of land, let's just say, and you're not gonna subdivide it and you're just gonna put apartments on it, then chapter 17100 doesn't even come into play and therefore our minimum block length requirements and pedestrian cut through requirements don't come into play either. Oh, and that's one thing, it's, it's a little more ambiguous when it's a multifamily if there's no subdivision associated with it. Okay, so what we're, what, what we're saying or what's helpful to me is that the, the pathway in my scenario of single families, the pathway you're saying is being picked up by the block length. So it would be streets and sidewalks, not a, a single pathway. Correct. Although if you guys chose, or if the commission chose to add additional code standards related to pathways to parks, I don't think that would be a bad idea. I, I would just need direction on that. I see what you're saying. Um, it's gonna be within couple hundred feet of the park which is it should be yes i like it i like any type of walkway where you can exclude the you know i mean sidewalks are great but just having that pathway through i think really gives it a different feel and connectivity within the communities but that's just my personal preference mm-hmm I'm just about access, so it's indifferent to me, pathway or sidewalk. It's it's just as long as they have, as long as the community has access to the park. Right. Mm -hmm. It's so it sounds like it's unanimous, or um, I don't want to speak for Commissioner Lee, but it sounds like it's pretty unanimous that you guys agree with the concept of making sure that there's a, as much connectivity between multifamily and um any subdivision proposals to parkland as we can make it mm -hmm. like it's pretty unanimous that we should beef up the code to make that one of the main sticking points or requirements it sounds like yeah i think so i agree i agree 
And so do I. <laughs> Yeah, especially since the uh, per person requirement is going up, that's going to mean a little bigger park when they do take the park option. Yeah. Any other uh, questions that you have for us on uh, 8620, uh, Kelly? So I guess my main thing with this section is I, I really want to look at these three requirements more, flush them out more, do you want me to bring this back before the planning commission with those revisions, or do you just want me to move forward with going to city council with them? As is, or with the, or with trying to revise what we've talked about. Yeah, I, I mean, I would work with, I would try to work with, get some in, additional input from ESA on these, you know, A, B, and C, and then also additional input from our attorney's office because I'm already seeing. As I said, I was writing these last three up at the last minute and I'm already poking holes in my own writing here. So would you rather me just work with uh, the attorneys in ESA and move forward to council or would you rather me bring this back before yeah. you? Chair, Chair Kelly, question on that real quick. If, um, if we forward and forward and say, go ahead and work with ESA on it and it's published and we look at it after the, after the fact, and we want a change in it, um, is that even possible? Uh, and what are those steps like? Or should we be cautious and not move forward with it until we see the revision on, on those three primaries? Kelly, I think once the, this, the planning commission makes a recommendation, approves a recommendation, then it's forwarded to the city council and it sits there and you wouldn't be able to, I mean, the city council, I suppose, could send it back to you, but you wouldn't have any uh, ability to call it back and make more changes. So I think if, if you're concerned that you might want to see more changes, you probably ought to send us a way to do some more work and then we'll bring it back to you. Although having having said that, and I, I agree with that, but the uh, there is another option, um, and that is the public hearing before city council. In other words, we could uh, we're already suggesting that Kelly make changes of wording, and and he knows that, and he'll do it. Um, and if Kelly were to inform us, okay, here's how I have reworded this section. This is how it's going to city council at this public hearing just as as citizens as well as speaking on, as a commissioner not on not on behalf of the commission but you would have an opportunity in public testimony to say you know we really we were thinking this or i was thinking this that's that's just a way of not slowing down the process i, yep. I get you, a feeling you can always correct you can testify as a resident of the city uh, but the planning commission, as you, nobody could speak on behalf of the planning commission, the planning commission can only speak by majority of quorum. Right. Sure. I would just have a hard time forwarding something that I haven't seen final wording on personally. I, it's, I get the gist of it. Like I think it would be done well, but I mean, that, that's the main crux of, of 8610. And if it's not written and we don't know what it's going to say, I would have a hard time putting my, my, my name behind it for forwarding today. I want to see it again, but I too don't want to slow the process down. I just, but I want to be accurate with what I'm pushing, putting forward with my name behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I sh share uh, Commissioner Maiden's uh, views on that, but at the same time, I feel confident of working with Kelly and his staff that he understands the intent, because I think what we're talking about, I, I know what we're talking about here is just making it more livable for the people that come into the place and, and with the walkways, et cetera. And how to wordsmith that, we've hit the we've hit this so many different times with the front, the, the front of the houses turned this way or that way. So anything is an improvement and I don't wanna slow the process down. So with all that being said is I'm comfortable with uh, Kelly working with staff and associates to, to make it better. Um, yeah, I, this may be a question for the attorney, but okay, 
Kelly's working on the rewording. And before he goes to city council, he shares it with either just with Chris or with all of us and says, here's, here's where it's going. Now, I understand we can't speak on a, on a meeting, but can we just give input at that level to Kelly without any formalness, just either say, yeah, I, I understand what, how you've written it or look at it and say, what, what if such and such, like we've been doing tonight, is, is that still okay? It, it, that, that's it, that's right on the, the line. I mean, I, it may be an excess of caution, but I'm concerned that would look a lot like a public meeting under the guise of not a public meeting. Okay, you know, you're all deliberating on something that's pending before the city, um, and giving your input to staff with the expectation that that will all be consolidated and presented to the city council. Um, if it's just a matter of another couple of weeks, my recommendation is to um, let us work on it and bring it back to you. I would support that. I think that once it leaves us, we don't really have much we can do to make changes. Okay. And, and uh, keeping in mind too, I, I'm speaking to myself now that when it comes back to us, we're just looking at these um, Ten, a 10 page proposal, we won't have the one that we just looked at the big one that that this is springing off of. Um, so it, it shouldn't be shouldn't be a long discussion if yeah, well, it, well, we may add three more or yeah, three more commissioners in that meeting and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I would be hoping to do if we did do that is um, I would come back with revised code language for seven. You know what we, yeah, I would come back with revised code language just for 1786 since it seems like there's not much input for 1732. Um, <laughs> and probably with a very brief staff report, just saying, here's what I've changed since the last time. So it'd just be a right. couple sentences long. Hopefully we could discuss that for 20 minutes and then you could forward a recommendation can we forward a recommendation of everything but 178620? <laughs> not real. Well, okay. no, it's okay. I don't want to make it harder than it is. Not real. I mean, I would prefer not to just because then we're doing two ordinances and bring it before the council twice and everything else. So, okay. It also denies um, 18 point, 178620 the context of the surrounding sections within which it, you know, is, yeah, goes along with. Yeah. And then I, in an ideal world, um, I would have spent more time on this, but I was kind of rushing to meet some deadlines. And that was kind of the last section, unfortunately, that I looked at and threw it together quickly. And then since I sent this out last Monday, I've noticed that it wasn't written that great. So I kind of knew this was going to be an issue coming into tonight. We're glad to help. I can <laughs> really see it as an issue. I think it's an opportunity. So, you know, nothing wrong with what you've put together here at all. I feel bad for stalling it for like a month or so, but I think it's look it's best for the long term. And I, I would even say I don't know if it's possible, but could you have a special a special commission meeting to just go over this topic as soon as you got it done? I don't know if that's even a possibility, but if you could, I would volunteer my time to come back just to get it moving. Um, but it would take the rewrite in order to do it. Yeah, I would rather just wait to the September twenty seventh meeting. Um, and if you if you continue it to a date certain tonight, and Mr. Crean can correct me if I'm wrong, but staff doesn't have to re-notice through the paper and do all the other things. It'll just be a continuance to a date certain meeting. Right. Correct. Okay. So that. Yeah. Add it to the agenda. <laughs> Make it longer. <laughs> I did have one other thing that. Um, and this is in 1732-20. It's a question. Um, on the permitted uses, section B, um, and we talked. you talked about using 21st century language and so forth. Uh, is pump tracks in the definition section 
or will it be? And the reason I ask is, you know, 15 years from now, when we have the same code, is there enough there for us to understand? The other ones I think are, were, were to me pretty straightforward. They're kind of going to be, uh, you know, their definitions will still be around in 15 years, but pump tracks wasn't here 15 years ago that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I, I have three kids under the age of 10 and the pump tracks are probably one of the like top two or three park features that they love using. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think with all the kids that now BMX and skateboard and everything, I, I don't see that. I think they're only going to rise in popularity would be my guess. Um, we could add additional clarity to that if you would like. It, you know, it, it's not a critical thing. It was just that as I was reading through that, that one kind of struck me as having a more 21st century definition, although disc golf, you could argue the same thing, but the, <laughs> the phrase itself, disc golf courses kind of explains it, but I, it's, I, I'm not, I'm not going to the wire on that one. It was just a, you know, a, an observation. Jerry, we're getting old. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm thinking ahead to 15 years oh. from now when, when it's still in the code, knowing how slowly things get changed. Um, it's funny. Yeah, our grandkids are going to be asking us, Grandpa, what, what was a pump track back in your day? <laughs> oh, my brother. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so if there's no further discussion, what I believe we have to do is reopen the meeting and continue it to a date certain. You, you can continue open. it and reopen it that night. Okay, so we can just make a motion. Right, the matter is still on the table before you, so just continue it and then um, you can reopen it for additional public testimony in two weeks. Okay, so then the motion would be to uh, continue it to, do we, is that September date? Okay, Kelly? Yeah, September 27th. And it will okay. be the first thing, I'll put it as the first item just so we can jump right into that, hopefully clarify that and then move into the two, the two new hearings. So it'd be old, under old business, which we almost never have on our agendas. Right. Okay, so the motion then would be to uh, uh, continue the public hearing to uh, September 27 to give staff time to um, work on 178020, 8220, 8620. Does that work for us uh, for the motion? I see a nod. Somebody want to so move? So move. And I second the so move. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to continue this public hearing. Pick it up on September 27th uh, to give staff time to uh, work on section 1786-20. And click off of my things here. I'm not going to do a roll call vote. All in favor, give us a heads up for our thumbs up. Unanimous to move it ahead to the 27th. Okay. That's all I see on the agenda. So we can have a motion if somebody wants to. Uh, well, I guess you're all at home. I'm at my office, but uh, <laughs> and Kelly's at the office. But somebody make a motion for us. Sarah, I make a motion that we close the meeting. And I will second. Been moved and seconded to adjourn at 8.09. All in favor, thumbs up. I see unanimous again. Great meeting tonight, everyone. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, y'all. Yep. Good night, Chad. Good night, David. <laughs> <laughs>